Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special live edition of Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer books, TV shows, movies, and more. And because we are doing this live, hopefully we're not going to biff it too much because we uh, don't have an editor who can just take those pieces out and stick them at the end. So I'm Tara Scott. I review queer women's fiction at The Lesbian Review, Lambda Literary, Smart Bitches, Trashy Books, and I am thrilled that we're here at TLR's Sexy Reads event. Thank you so much, Sheena, for asking us to be a part of it. You basically said everything I was going to, but I'm Chris Bryant, and I'm a contemporary romance writer with about 20 books under my belt through uh, Bold Strokes Books, and I'm excited that everybody is here. So for everyone who is here live in the event session, honestly, like, please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the chat. We're planning on saving time at the end, so if there's anything you've been burning to ask us, whether it is a, it could be about erotic books or it could be about anything like how long is chris's hair for real because from here it looks very long <laughs> you can it's super long super long <laughs> i know i need to get a cut this is the thing i really do need to get a cut and i say that every podcast and every time i do a panel and it just gets longer and i never cut it so well i mean it's it's Rapunzel. the source of your strength so you know uh, so yeah, honestly, drop your questions in the chat. We'll save some time at the end. And because this is a live event, we're doing something a little bit different. And instead of following our typical format, we're going to be doing mostly recommendations. But first, Chris, I hear there's something exciting in the queer world that you would like to celebrate. I really want to celebrate the first non-binary Olympian. I don't know who that is. Tell me more. Timothy Leduc. They are an American uh, pair of an American uh, figure skating team. And it's just, it was so refreshing. This was like brand spanking new information. And I was so excited. I mean, having queer rep in the Olympics has started to really roll mm -hmm. the last, what, two Olympics. And so I'm so excited that this is happening because, you know, the queers have been in the Olympics like since the beginning. We all know this. Everybody was in the closet. And it wasn't, I think, until 1988 when the first. I want to say, yeah, it was 1988 when there was an actual out and proud Olympian. Um, I think that's right. But, geez, most of the time you hear about it after they're done and they have their awards and their medals and their, you know, whatever their Wheaties or whatever they're sponsoring, <laughs> you know, something yeah. like that. So it was really cool that this is, like, non-binary in the Olympics. That was great. So cool. And in the chat, Tiffany shares that Canada women's hockey team – Go Canada is the most LGBTQ team ever Yay, in history. Yay, Canada. That's amazing. So that good. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So I'm glad that we talked about that. So that is what I wanted to, to get off my chest today before we started our... Yeah, our Chris was texting me last journey. night. We have to talk about the Olympics. And I was like, okay, I haven't watched anything, but let's go. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris... Yes. Before our recommendations, also, you have also written erotic romance. How did that come about? I'm sorry, Britt Ryder. Britt Ryder, your alter Brit Ryder. ego. <laughs> Britt Ryder is here. Okay, so when I when I wrote my very first book, Jolt, after that was published, I met with my editor. I went to California and met with my editor, Ashley, and Ashley was like, look, like, don't let it go to your head because readers were saying, oh, the sex is great. You know, maybe you should think about it. And I'm like, oh, you know, big head. Oh, yeah, I've <laughs> sex. So I'll just go ahead and do it. And so I had like a few chapters of something I'd written. And Ashley's like, absolutely not. This is horrible. What are you thinking? None of this is right. You can't do this. So she gave me an assignment to read the book Macho Sluts. I don't know. Have you ever read it? I okay. So don't let me think I've you. even <laughs> heard about it. I don't think. Okay. It is by, and I'm not quite sure if I'm pronouncing the last name right, Pat Califia? Pat Califia? Oh, right. did Sinclair oh. talk about that? Maybe. When we maybe talked to them? Thing. Yeah. Maybe so. so. Maybe. So for anybody who doesn't know, we recently on the podcast had a bonus episode with Sinclair Sexsmith, uh, editor of the Best Lesbian Erotica of the Year, and they talk about uh, Pat Califia a few times. So if you want to also know more, that's a, a place you can go. So I was not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for it. And so I said, okay, yeah, no, I'm not ready yet. So I had to wait. And, you know, 
I have learned being a writer that there, it really is a process to, to get to that point to where you have to be also personally comfortable writing about it and reading about it. Mm-hmm. And so, and I wasn't there at the very beginning of my writing story. And so when I finally felt comfortable enough, I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And so I did it. And people liked it. They, they liked Even it. better. Yeah. But yeah. we're not here to recommend right. your books. No. Although we could, but we're not going to. <laughs> so Chris, we each came prepared with a few yes. uh, options. And however many we share truly depends on however many questions we get in the chat. So like we said, we're saving time for you all. What is your first recommendation today? Well, I don't think that we can actually talk about lesbian erotic romance or erotica without mentioning Megan O'Brien. It's true. I don't. I don't. I, very I think we might get arrested if we didn't do that. Know, but we then did. we. But then we might like it. I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> This might be a short story for Brett Ryder in the future, I'm thinking. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Let's see. <laughs> maybe. Okay, so The Night Off by Megan O'Brien was written in uh, 2012. And I'm just going to go ahead and read kind of the blurb. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I usually do it. Emily Parker, Parker has a busy life over which she maintains ironclad control. Raised by drug-addicted parents, she used to take care of people around her to the exclusion of her own needs, but not tonight. After years of celibacy, she's ready to pay for exactly what she wants, to surrender control by having it taken away. Hardworking, hard, jeez, here we go. This is the part where I need Neil to edit this. Ah! <laughs> having worked as a high-priced escort for years, Nat Sway not only knows her job, she's damn good at it. Dangerously sexy, she knows precisely how to fulfill the fantasies of women who enjoy her special brand of make-believe, all without ever becoming emotionally involved. When their night of intense play turns into something more, Emily and Nat can't help but pursue a connection in the real world. Unfortunately, old... Here we go again. (laughs) I really do get through this. I really do. do. Old habits die hard and love isn't always enough. So, this is an amazing book and for so many different reasons. I had a conversation with one of my friends. Um, We had talked about like what books I was going to recommend and I said this one and she was like... I don't know. You know, it's it's a little bit much because she said it was very intense. And I'm like, okay, so that's your opinion. It is intense. It is intense for sure. It's very intense. But so let's start off by saying Emily calls this uh, company called Extreme Encounters. Mm -hmm. And she pays thousands of dollars. And she takes this questionnaire, like, I mean, off, off the page, you know, that she takes this huge questionnaire about like everything she wants in this fantasy, you know, she's going to pay a shit ton of money to, to have it. So she wants to make sure she gets what she wants. So here's what she wants. She wants her control to be taken away. Yeah. Like she signed up for it. She wants to be a not so willing participant at first. That's how the book starts off. Mm-hmm. She wants dirty talk. The cruder, the better. And she wants somebody to bring her close to orgasm, but deny her that satisfaction. That's it. Yeah. Uh, she wants verbal humiliation, and then she wants strap on and spanking. And these are all things that she signed up for, and it's very clear. Like Megan talks about consent throughout this whole book, mm-hmm. and she's a very good writer about that, about having consent in her books. So, so Emily agrees upon this before she even like signs her name and pays the money. So here's what I learned: what, like when we were just talking about Sinclair, mm-hmm. you know, there are kinks out there that may or may not be your cup of tea. And there's a level of openness and acceptance when you read erotica, I think. And consent is sexy, and so is kink. And it's not for everybody, but you just kind of have to know that it's okay. Like, these things are okay. I think this is a case, too, where it shows that consensual, dubious consent play can be sexy, too. That that you can even play with the concept of consent in a way that's consensual, and that can be something really satisfying and fulfilling right right and so so like the whole thing is you know she gets she it's so funny because like they have a safe word like Mm -hmm. she basically kind of gets kidnapped at the beginning a gnat set whispers her safe word which also happens to be mine how weird is that (laughs) unicorn so um i'm just i'm learning about you i didn't know (laughs) that So she whispers unicorn so that Emily knows that she really isn't getting attacked, that this is what she signed up for. And this is the start of her night, uh, the night off. So 
what do we know? We know like Nat is the best of the best. She's the the cream of the crop. So on top. sweet. I think that was one of the things that I really loved about Nat because so this was one of the first. It was probably within the the first ten uh, lesbian romances that I ever read, and it was kind of like a whoa, okay, all right, here we are. And I think the thing that I loved was kind of that dichotomy between who Nat is in like when she's working or when they're having sex because some of it does continue even after it's not um, a paid relationship and then who she is outside the bedroom that there's this like super domineering hunky incredible and that but then it's like hey can I just like make make you an omelet please (laughs) with all your favorite ingredients like so sweet and nurturing and lovely and again that idea of like we're all complex. We all have different things that together make who we are. Yeah. And, and and during this whole book, you know, the relationship is so nice because they started off completely stripped down, mm-hmm. literally and figuratively. But I mean, just, you know, mm-hmm. the whole, like everything was out there. They knew their dark, their, you know, deepest, darkest desires, you know. And when you build a relationship up from that, it's going to go a lot quicker. I think. Yeah. And so they basically fall in love pretty quickly. But when the emotions come in, it's completely believable. You know, it's a great starter, not really a starter book. Maybe it's a medium book of erotica that I would recommend to somebody. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and it includes like a, a cranky teenage sister that we have to deal with. And, and there's actually a really great scene with the sister when she actually meets Nat for the first time. Yeah. So it's lovely. Uh, so I, yeah. So I, this book, is, you know, it's a solid read, it has BDSM. Uh, love butch femme sex toys anything you could want like this is a solid read and i really enjoyed it nice i also recommend that awesome cool well what's your first recommendation then so my first recommendation is party favors by jamie clevenger have you ever read it i have not did you ever read choose your own adventure books when you were young yes yes so Party Favors is a super sexy choose your own adventure, but for grown-ups and just like those old choose your own adventure books, it's written in the second person so that the reader oh, cool. is the main character. And so the premise is that you've taken a week long break from your girlfriend. You need a little bit of space, a little bit of perspective, but you're meeting her. So her name is Janine. She told you to come to a fancy dress party. And because she's German, you well maybe probably not you you Dutch. you wouldn't do this because you're german so you <laughs> but but i'm gonna guess most readers are not um so as the main character you think that she's talking about a costume party except it's a black tie event and you show up to a black tie event in a batman <laughs> costume <laughs> which i totally would this is the greatest thing ever and so your first choice is a you can face up to janine and stay because you need a glass of champagne and your night can't get any worse <laughs> Or B, you can leave the party with a wave of your cape and an ounce of dignity. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter what you choose. And that's true of like most of the choices within the book until you get to the end of the branch. Almost no matter what you choose, you're going to get laid. There is (laughs) so much sex in this. If you stay, Janine gives you a hall pass for the night and you agree to meet up in the morning to decide if you're going to stay together and be exclusive or not. And this was so much fun. No two encounters were the same and understanding, like I knew what I signed up for when I read this book, like it was very clear what the premise was going to be. So every time I met a new person, I was like, ooh, do I get to bang this one? Like it could be the party host, there was a local actress, there was a member of the wait staff, my best friend, even an executive so from the place where I work, who I read into is at a sex shop and it was just like, am I, do I get to bang this person? <laughs> do, do I not? I don't know. <laughs> And so there's all kinds of like, there's sweet and slow sex with lots of feelings. And there's even um, sleeping with somebody that I've just met and I'm about to get on stage with them at a drag show, which, you know, very fun. And some characters, you have sex with them in more than one scene. And the way that happens, it changes so that sometimes you're topping them, sometimes they're topping you. And so, I mean, if you like to read anything in a lesbian sex scene, you will find it in this book. Plus wow. a Batman costume. <laughs> I mean, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to read it. I'm going to have to read it. I think you should. It's a great time. So, Chris, nice. what is yes. your next book? My next book is uh, Harper Bliss, Seasons of Love. 
I liked that. Has anybody one. read that? Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good. I liked it because. Well, let's talk about it. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm gonna try to do this again. We're gonna try to read the blurb because okay. you know I'm gonna stumble 14 times. I believe in you. I know. Me too. Go me. <laughs> Is age really just a number? Alice McAllister is a successful solicitor who likes a quiet, disciplined life, for sure. But when her business partner Miranda forces her to take a vacation at her holiday home in Portugal, the presence of Miranda's daughter Joy turns Alice's world upside down. Despite their age difference, Alice and Joy embark on a fiery holiday romance until they have to return home to London. Will Alice be able to forget about Joy and what she has awakened in her? And how can she face Joy's mother without a guilt without guilt after such an appassionate summer fling? So, Alice goes on vacation. Joy shows up for a few days to unwind. So Joy, okay, <laughs> and so they Joy unwind. is 20. Yeah, <laughs> and they do, let me tell you. So so Joy is 29 going on 16. Mm-hmm. I really felt like at the beginning of the book she's very not not really immature, but she really likes to tease Alice. Mm-hmm. You know, she knows that Alice is uncomfortable, mm-hmm. so she likes she likes to be naked. You know, she she you know well, I sure. grew up in Europe. Everybody was naked. Like my, our neighbor used to mow naked. No woman. <laughs> yes. So she used to like topless. Okay, she wasn't naked, but she she had shorts on and she oh, would okay. mow. And so it like like my like whenever we went to the beach, everybody was naked. You know, I've always been around naked people. Like. When I, that sounds weird, mm-hmm. but not really, not like my whole <laughs> life, but I'm just saying I grew up with it. And like at some point, I even went around topless. And I think like once I hit puberty, something happened. Like mm-hmm. I just got really shy. And like to this day, not a single person can actually say that they've seen my cleavage. I mean, it's just one of those things. Were you back? Like, were was your family living in the U.S. at that point? Or were you, was your family still in Europe? Um, Yeah, I moved here when I was a teenager, a young teenager. So you know, everything happened at once. Me back here, puberty. I mean, North America is super puritanical. I know. I know. And seeing it, it happened. Mm-hmm. I fell victim to it. So she likes to go topless and Alice is kind of uncomfortable about it. She finally, you know, Joy finally says, hey, does this make you uncomfortable? And she's like, yes. And I thought it was weird that she didn't immediately ask. Because, like, I wouldn't, like, even though it's my house, mm-hmm. I would still be like, hey, is it okay that I'm topless? So I thought, you know, I was kind of like, meh, I don't know about this. But then Alice is extremely, they're extreme opposites. Like, Alice is very, she's 51 going on 80. <laughs> so we have somebody who's, like, 29 going on 16 and yeah. 51 going on 80. Yeah. And, like, and when they finally do come together, you know, it, it, was, it was such an interesting story. You know, I'm a Harper Bliss fan. I have mm. been reading her for a very long time since I started reading Lesvik. It was funny. I looked through my, my Kindle and she was one of the first ones that I've had yeah. or that I had on my Kindle. So, you know, the writing is smooth. Uh, you get to see both characters grow. You get to actually see Joy become, approach a relationship. She hasn't really ever had a relationship before. Mm-hmm. And, and so Alice is finally understanding, hey, I like women. And so they're both kind of like, starting this journey together on this 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 new relationship and figuring things out and like it's great but alice wants to keep it hidden and joy's like no i want to tell my mom I'm like how do you tell your mom that you know your best friend that you're sleeping with her daughter and you've known this family for a really long time so i don't but this, know i yeah like, it's a tough one i do i'm trying to imagine even just like one of my friends telling me now of course in this scenario my dad has to be dead or something like hey I'm deeply in love with your mother, and I I right. don't know how I would feel about that. I mean, I suppose, you know, good for mom, but also, like, mm, that would be yeah, that's a tough hard. One. Well, yeah. and thinking, too, about, like, how old my kids are now and my friends around me. Yeah, if somebody right. came to me in 10, 15 years and was like, uh, so your daughter and I are deeply in love, I would be like, hmm. I'm going to deeply love stabbing you. Next. <laughs> That's exactly right. And so, so like the reaction that, that Miranda has is totally understandable. It's believable. Yeah. You know, you want the relationship to work, but also you understand that, you know, you, you sympathize with Miranda and you're just like, I don't know, like, uh, I, I'd feel the same way, mm-hmm. you know, but it's such a well-written book and the sex is, is great. It's, it starts off, you know, and it's really hot. And and the love works itself in, and it's just it was a, such an enjoyable read, so I highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. That's a great one. That's a great pick. Yeah. What about you? What is your next recommendation? Okay, 
So I feel like this is just like what a great coincidence because it is an Olympic story. In addition to being an erotic oh! romance, it is called Fire on the Ice by Tamsin Parker. Although in this book, they're called the Snow and Ice Games, which uh, to me screams somebody <laughs> saying, please, please don't sue me, International yeah. Olympic <laughs> Committee. I'm just an independent author and I can't afford to license the name Olympic, <laughs> which is like, fair enough. Everybody knew and it was fine. Right. Um, and so it opens with figure skater Maisie Harper. She's known as Canada's Ice Princess because she's very, very icy, everybody thinks. She's quite um, closed off and she's not like it's she's hard to build relationships with. But she is sitting at the bar in the athlete's village, which would be pretty unusual for her. She's not the bar type, except that she's hoping to run into Blaze Bellamy, who is a speed skater from I think from the U.S., uh, yeah, it must be because she would run into. Okay, fun fact. So where I live in okay. Calgary, they have Olympic training facilities here because of the '88 Olympics, and so I do know that they all know each other. So yes, Blaze is American, and <laughs> they had had a fling four years prior at the last games, and Blaze is very happy to see Maisie at the bar because her memories of that are equally fond, and that is why she says yes. Maisie basically says. I think we should bang a lot uh, during our three weeks here and we shouldn't bang other people. And Blaze is polyamorous. And so she typically, even when she's in a relationship, she might be romantically exclusive, but she is not sexually exclusive. But she's like, you know what? It's three weeks and I really like Maisie and I'm down. That's okay. And... They kind of just, I, I love seeing how in between events and in between everything, they would just kind of like find each other as often as they could. But Maisie doesn't like to be in the spotlight and Blaze feels like any publicity is good publicity. You know, she has this motto that she lives by. If I can't be victorious, I'd like to be notorious. And so that's kind of the like, can a relationship actually happen between people like this? Or is Blaze's desire to be in the public eye going to be a problem for them? So I quite liked these characters a lot. Blaze is like, if you picture in your mind, just this like roller derby badass fantasy girl. <laughs> that's basically I'm who in. she is, right? <laughs> right. Like total thrill seeker, whether it's something that's going to end up with her in the tabloids or it's something in the bedroom. Like she's just, she's all, she's an adrenaline junkie, kind of always on to the next thing. And Maisie is like every stereotype i couldn't remember the word stereotype that's cool that's fine <laughs> Maisie is like every stereotype of polite canadians and she just keeps Aww. her head down and she just wants she wants a medal so bad she's never had one before and so everyone thinks she's an ice queen because they never really get to see who she is they don't get to see her vulnerabilities or her fears or her passion and blaze is like the first person there to really take the time to see who she is and so while like there is a lot of sex in this book, and especially in the first half, which I thought was a little unusual, like not unwelcome, um, but often when it's a full length novel, you'll see it kind of like building to that. Whereas it's like, oh, no, OK, the sexual chemistry is happening. The next question is, are they compatible as humans? And so other things that I liked was that like as thrill seeking as blazes and all that, like for me, that would have made her the way they the way they portrayed her, it would have made it an obvious choice for her to be the dominant person in the bedroom. But she's not. Oh, <laughs> it was so good because Maisie comes in and is basically basically just like. I am going to tell you what is up and you are going to like it. And that is how it is going to be. And Blaze is like, yes, ma'am. Please and thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's so good. And, you know, she gets the kind of compliance from Blaze that would be hard to imagine from any of her other sexual partners, whether they're men or women, because she's just like a gigantic, like, fuck you. I do what I want all the time. And something else that I liked quite a lot, because... When I was reading it, I was a little bit nervous. I think I read this about, I'm trying to think, I think it came out about four or five years ago. And um, Blaze is not only polyamorous, but she's bisexual. And so again, like as a bisexual reader, I was like, oh shit, are we going to get a bunch of stereotypes about like 
slutty bisexual people and like there's some people that use the word slut really positively and some people that use it really negatively and so <laughs> it just it didn't it didn't happen like i really loved that blazes sexuality her desires her appetite it's celebrated and honored and Maisie never brings it up as a negative and never makes her feel bad about it. And so when they get there happily ever after, I was afraid that Blaze was going to have to make a choice that wouldn't be true to who she is as a person, that she would have to make the kind of compromise that she would have to go against her own personal fundamental values. And she doesn't. Like, it, it is a happily ever after that we don't see typically in romance. It's the only time I've seen it. Um, but I thought it was just perfect. And for the person in the chat who asked what's the name of the book, it's called Fire on the Ice. And Tamsin Parker is the author. Honestly, I love all of Tamsin Parker's yeah. FF books. She does one. The name completely escapes me. Oh, it's called In Her Court, which is not erotic, but is like super, super fun and takes place at an adult sleepaway camp. So if you just want like something fun to escape from the world. Hey, I did it. I stuck another recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> and I have I'm, I'm like the Russian doll of recommendations. I'm going to recommend this, and as a result, we're going to do this and this. <laughs> Chris, what's your next recommendation? Well, I think this is one that we both can talk about. Um, I threw away all my notes. I thought, <laughs> I was like, oh, we're done. No, we're fuck not. It. We're not done. Oh, fuck it, we're done. Uh -huh. Um, no, I think we need to talk about the sex therapist next door. Yes, we do. Yes, this we is do. by Megan O'Brien, uh, another uh, book by Megan O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this has such back and forth, like like half the people loved it. Yes. And half the people were just like, oh, I can't deal with it. I, so we need to talk about this. I agree. I don't think I've actually seen a more polarizing book than The what? Sex Therapist ne Next Door because people either love it or they completely hate it. I fall in the love camp. I mean, I don't I don't think I can say that it's like a hundred percent perfect book, but for me it's like a four and a half out of five. Yeah, it's it certainly makes you question things, but at the same time, what I loved about it was you knew I mean, that was another thing. You know, people talk about, you know, uh the characters, the two characters. Okay, let's talk kind of about the plot for people who haven't mm -hmm. uh read this book or don't know about this book. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. The sex therapist <laughs> next door. Yeah, I mean, that is like an so, on the nose title <laughs> yeah, for sure. That that sums it up right there. Yeah. So, um, Diana Kelly is the sex therapist next door to uh, Jude. I think yep. is, is Jude. Yeah, Jude. And Diana is thirty nine years old, and so she has a she puts on a um, in a live in person. Is this a thing? By the I way? have uh, no idea. If anyone so knows, please know. drop it in the chat. Is this a thing? I know. But like, it's like in-person sex class, basically. And so where couples come in, I think she has like 16 people in the first class that she performs. It is real. Okay. Fantastic. Totally thing. I was wondering Why the same thing because I don't think they're available in Calgary. In here. I know they're not in the Midwest <laughs> at all. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I've looked. But I, I just, I thought it was fascinating. And so, so basically, her assistant, which is also her ex-lover and best friend, Ava, falls on a ladder, hurts her, breaks her back, mm -hmm. actually. And so she's trying to find somebody to fill in for Ava because she could lose out on, you know, thousands of dollars, every, you know, for mm -hmm. the, over the course of this six-week class. And so, so she goes next door to her neighbor, who is Jude, who's 26 years old, and she's hot, and she has sex all the time, and they hear each other having sex through the walls, because I guess their bedrooms are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so she's like, well, you know, she's real shy, and she's like, oh, I don't know how to say this, but uh, will you be the stand-in person for my sex class that's coming up? Because it was that day, that day, mm -hmm. Saturday, it was a Saturday, so Saturday night, and here's what I, it's kind of linguist 101 it's like how to eat pussy 101 mm -hmm. will you like be my subject and she's like hell yes okay sounds like a great saturday night because she has a crush on diana and diana is emotionally unavailable so it's so anyway so the whole consent thing is that like she tells her in advance like 
we're going to get into spanking. We're going to get into strap on sex. We're going to get into anal play. We're going to get into all these different things, like spells it out for her. And then there's the consent. She's like, yes, I'm down. Yes, I'm good with this. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, I'm not too sure about this one, but let's try it. And so, so it's really, um, I thought it was great. I mean, like Mm -hmm. the whole thing, like the whole consent thing. And so there's this buildup where Jude is really starting to feel, since she already has like this crush on Diana, she feels this, like she could feel the emotions coming out every time they have sex. And Diana is like cut off. She's like, I had a really bad relationship. Mm -hmm. I cannot open myself up like that again, ever, ever. I'm emotionally unavailable to you. So don't fall in love with me. And Jude's like, Oh, I can't, I can't. So. (laughs) Well, I think that's part of why people don't like it because frankly, Diana is a complete asshole to Jude at parts. For sure. But she, yeah. And, and, the thing about it is she has mixed signals. Like when totally. they're in the session, she's like, sweetheart, you're so beautiful. Like everything, you know, she's like acting like her real, we say real self, but it's her therapist self. And so yeah. she's like giving Jude all the signals, you know, the, hey, we're good to go. Come on, let's have a relationship. But then like outside of class, she's like, okay, see you later. Bye. Yeah. She yeah. lays out and the so- boundaries and then her behavior doesn't actually right. align with what she's laid out as the boundaries. Like, yeah. And she falls back on it too. Well, I already told you that we can't, ha- I already told you I was straight up. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah. But in terms of what's good. So for me, I feel like this so I don't know who, how many folks here were at the session yesterday with the TLR team, but I think I said more than once that for myself, um, if I'm reading an erotic romance or if I'm reading an erotica, I want every single sex scene to be doing some kind of work, to be doing some kind of heavy lifting. Like it is, it has to be contributing to character development. It has to be contributing to story development. And so for me, this book in that respect ends up being kind of like a master class because there are times when we join Diana and Jude and they're already partway through an encounter. We don't see the buildup that leads to the sexual activity. We're in there because that's what the story required. Or there was even, you know, there's times where a scene breaks before everyone's had their orgasms and it's like, wait, what? Where's that payoff? And it's like, well, that's not what this scene is meant to do right now. It is being used for story. Therefore, it's doing exactly what it needs to do. And I thought that was so interesting in a way that I don't know if I've ever seen that before. I may have. I mean, I also have a notoriously not amazing memory. So if I read a book a decade ago, I'm definitely not going to remember that. Um, But it's it's something that especially stood out for me because it defied my expectations and then reminded me of why I even have expectations around what sex should be doing in erotic romance. What worked really well for you with this one? You know, I liked, there are people out there like Diana. I mean, all of Mm -hmm. us to a certain extent, you know, we're broken. um, And I feel like she was continually punishing herself, really, if you think about it, uh, by not allowing herself to feel and to care and to actually love and allow love back in her life. Mm -hmm. So I like that whole, like, I'm such an asshole to you, but at the same time, I really want to have this affair. I want to have this relationship with you, but I don't know how to do it because the last time Mm -hmm. I did it, it was really hard and it was very abusive and I don't know how to get back there in my life. So I really, you know, as, as like, like we mentioned, you know, she was such a jerk to, to Jude, but at the same time, I mean, she was, I think, you know, there's that whole push sometimes when you're in a relationship, Mm -hmm. you push people away to see if they come back. And, and I don't like it. And a lot of people do that. And it's not necessarily wrong. It's just what they know to do as a protection. And so I yeah. felt that in this book. I really did. And uh, yeah, so I, I kind of liked how she got over that. See, uh, because I disagree with you a little bit, only in the sense that I think she was pushing her away because it was the like, I want to be the one in control of hurting my feelings interesting i want to like i'm gonna end this so you i'm gonna hurt myself so you can't be the one to hurt me i want to get in there first i'm gonna end it now but do they really mean it when people do that do they really mean it i like obviously i am not a psychologist and i cannot speak for all people (laughs) i'm not a therapist i'm not a sex therapist i am i I play one i am not a physiotherapist (laughs) i am not so 
I I mean I I have I have seen that kind of thing um before and I think it just depends on like she's been through a really rough experience and so it's one of those like I recognize that she's an asshole to Jude but I don't I personally don't hold it against her. Now, would I be upset if somebody did it to me in real life? Well, yes, but I think that's again that difference between reading versus actually experiencing. Right. Now, the one thing I did not like about this book mm-hmm. was that they placed so much or er- uh uh, Diana plays so much emphasis on their age gap. This is a this is an age gap. I par- both of mine, like all of mine, have been age gaps. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, um, I I I didn't like it that 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 was a big thing because thirty nine and twenty six really isn't that big of a difference. I mean, it is, but it's not horrible. It's not. It's it's there's there are adults. They're still yeah. It could be more prime. Yeah, it could be more. It could be like uh, Harper. It could be her. Yeah. I think what was it a fifty one and a twenty nine. Yeah, so that's a big age yeah. gap. She's like, and she's, good luck on that. I think she's done twenty five year age gaps too in other books. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. That's when you really got to talk to your friend and be like, "What are you <laughs> doing? Really think about this. Get your hand off my daughter. Like, look." <laughs> <laughs> um. So what? What other okay. thing about this? Because you probably read it like in the in a with your eyeballs and not listen to the audiobook. Right, right. I read it. Um read it. I did listen to the audiobook and it was narrated by Brittany Powers, aka Brittany Pope. And holy oh, really? Holy really? shit. Yes. It Stop. was so good. I probably should not have been listening to it on transit <laughs> at the time. And because I did, and then I was like, I gotta stop. I love it. This is not okay. <laughs> I am not okay. <laughs> I'm squishy. Please stop. <laughs> so, nobody needs to know that. So yeah, I would say do not listen to it in public transit or with friends and family around. <laughs> but it's For a sure. fabulous audiobook. I really oh, enjoyed good. it in that format. Good. Yeah. And I'm happy to hear that it's Brittany. That's exciting. So good, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So what about you? Are you going to talk about one more? I or, uh, have or one or questions? two more. So there haven't been any questions what? really in the chat. A lot of uh, comments and chatter. Karen, thank you. You are so sweet. Shared that watching us talk and have so much fun is going to make listening to the podcast even more fun in the Yay. future. So I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, honestly, you can ask us anything. Whatever you want. We're here. This is your time. Uh, and we're... Ten minutes to ask us anything. <laughs> so in the meantime, while you all think about that, I also am going to recommend a Harper Bliss story. Oh, good. Good, good, good. And so she has a series that's called French Kissing. And it has, oh, geez, I don't even know how many volumes it is at this point. It's like five or six of them or something like that. Uh, So I'm only going to be talking about the first one, although I recommend it all in general. And so it is a serial lesbian erotic story that's like a soap opera. (laughs) <laughs> and so when the first season, which you buy as a collection now, was released, it was released in six parts, and each one of them were supposed to be an episode, which, again, tying back to the idea of a soap opera, I just thought it was super clever. I loved that with the format. And they were released, oof, I'm trying to reach back real far in the memory banks. I can't remember if they were, like, a week apart or a month apart, but, like, you had to take them in as individual episodes. You didn't get the whole thing at once. And so it takes place in Paris at a PR agency, which is kind of uh, Barbier and Sear, and in that sort of where all the action happens. And so there's Juliet and Claire. They are former lovers. They're best friends, and they're the ones who built this PR agency together. Hmm. Definitely at a big cost to their personal lives because you don't get to be a top tier agency of any kind without giving up a lot of your personal life. So Juliet's been in a relationship with Nadia for about a decade, but their relationship is very rocky at this point. Claire has not had a long-term relationship for years, but she's had a lot of really fabulous one-night stands. So way to go, Claire. Good for her. (laughs) Go get it. They have one employee, Stephanie, who is kind of like the belle of the lesbian bar scene, and she's very happy with that. Also... (laughs) Many one night stands, probably a lot more than Claire. And again, go get it, Stephanie. Good for you. 
So Nadia, again, I know there's a lot of character names here. So again, Nadia is married to Juliet. See, even I'm getting confused. I'm talking about it. It's so much easier when you're reading it because it'll jump perspectives between different people. It's super easy to keep track of when you're reading it. But Juliet's wife, Nadia, sets Claire up with Margot. Margot is a trauma surgeon from a hosp- from the hospital where she works. So again, we get not just PR agency, but we get a little bit of medical drama happening with the trauma surgeons. And, you know, Claire's really happy with her. She feels like she's actually found the one woman who can really, you know, rein her in. And Steph, as much as she loves the idea of being single, starts to question that when she's assigned to work with, uh, she's like this high profile darling of French politics, Dominique LaRoche. I love Dominique LaRoche. And that does not change as the series goes on. They're probably my favorite couple of all the couples. I just, oh, I love it so much. And so... It's written in the third person, and the perspective shifts between Juliet, Nadia, Claire, Margot, and Steph. So we get to see what they're all like together as a group. We get to see what they're like when they're paired off in couples, and we get to see what they're like as individuals. The only thing that was disappointing for me in this particular volume is that we don't get to see Dominique's perspective. But where it worked out is that, um, <clears throat> pardon me, what, what worked out for me there is that Dominique is able to talk about herself well enough that you still get to know who she is. So I did read them one by one. And each time I was like, where is this next episode? I need it, please. (laughs) So if you can, when you go to read it, I highly recommend read them, like read one episode, put it down, walk away, do something for a while, come back to it because it just makes it that much sweeter, like so much better to read it all like that. Because I did listen to the audiobook and I listened to it all in one go. And it's very good. I mean, it's also Abby Creighton. So, like, ca- of course. Come on. <laughs> come on. There's a, like, it's a, there's a lot of sex in it. And Abby Creighton reading it is even better. Uh, the only thing I'll say is that if you cannot handle cheating in the stories, this is probably uh, not going to be the one for you. Um, but I found it like it's fun, it's sexy, it's super angsty. It's just it is a great one. Sounds like it. Mm-hmm. And in the chat, uh, someone shared that there are quite a number of age gap couples out there that have successful. Oh, for sure. This is for sure separate. Yes, to go back to your point that you're making about age gap couples, there are quite a number of age gap couples out there that have successful, very long term relationships. Food for thought. Yes, absolutely. I think we see a ton of them in our reading community um i do think it's interesting in books though how you kind of never know it's either going to be completely like not a thing not mentioned perhaps glossed over at best or it's like no well diana and diana is the perfect example of that no i cannot possibly in a relationship with you because i will sully you with how old i am which is like (laughs) are you fucking kidding me you just had your whole hand up inside her in this class in public. Like, <laughs> yeah. How is having a relationship, which is also, again, also completely fine. Like, if she doesn't want a relationship, I don't care that she's had her whole hand up inside her in a, in a class. But, like, I liked... Uh, the thing I liked about Diana, which I know I'm, I've gone off my own recommendation, back to your recommendation. <laughs> um <laughs> I liked seeing her become honest with herself because I think that's something that she wasn't totally able to do at first. And it's something that she had to grow towards and something that being with Jude helped her be able to do. I agree. Yeah. And same thing in the other one as well, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and Harper's. Yeah. (gasps) Yes. Sheena, your camera, your camera came on. Do you have things to say about (gasps) this? Are we done? That's okay. Good news. Because I was literally about to say. That is all for this episode. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, whether you are live or you are listening to this in the future on your favorite podcast app. If you are listening on a podcast app and have enjoyed the show, please hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts and you'll get notified whenever we release an episode. And if you're here live and you're not following us, please, please look up Queerly Recommended on your favorite podcast app. We would love to see you. And if you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites, just search for Queerly Recommended on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
or email us at podcast at queerly recommended.com. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.